We know that evolutionary change happens in species all the time. Natural selection operates on species through the form of selection pressures, causing species to change based on the available variations within their gene pool. The changing of species over time is referred to as microevolution. But what happens when so much change happens that a population of a given species is now so different from other members of a species that we have to refer to it as its own distinct species? This is called speciation, and this is the result of macroevolution. Macroevolution and microevolution aren't that different. It really comes down to time and the presence of barriers. In this video, we're going to talk about what a species is and how speciation occurs through the process of natural evolution. So stay tuned. Speciation occurs when enough changes happen within a population of a species that they become so different from other members of their species that they need to be rightly called a separate species unto themselves. This is the process of macroevolution, which is distinctly different from microevolution. Microevolution is simply the change in allele frequency within a population of a species. Macroevolution is essentially the accumulation of microevolution over a long enough time and in enough isolation. But before we talk about speciation, we should probably talk about what a species is exactly. Now, it's fairly easy to look at different things and say, okay, so for example, if we show you, if I showed you a picture of a cat and a dog, it'd be very easy for you to say, okay, well, those are clearly different species. And one of the reasons why is they just look so different from each other that you can say, okay, well, those two things are clearly distinct species. But what if I showed you all of these different pictures of dog breeds? There's a significant phenotypic difference between, for example, a Chihuahua and a Great Dane, or a Poodle and a Lhasa Apso. There are significant differences here. And if you looked at them phenotypically, you might be convinced and say those are clearly separate species. But they're not. In fact, every breed of dog you know is, a, is part of the same species. In fact, technically speaking, every dog breed you know is also within the same species as the gray wolf, despite their extreme phenotypic differences. And let's look at this example. This is an Eastern and a Western meadowlark. Look how similar they appear. Yet they are considered to be two distinct species of meadowlarks. So how can we de truly define a species? It turns out that in some cases, it's a little trickier than you might think. And what about grizzly bears and polar bears? Are grizzly bears and polar bears the same species or two different species? I know you think there's an easy answer to this, but I want you to hold this thought and we'll talk about it again at the end of this video. And the answer may surprise you. Our typical way of defining a species in modern biological contexts is through something called the biological species concept. The BSC states that a species is any group of individuals who can reproduce to produce viable offspring. Now that sounds pretty simple. If we look at a dog and a cat, for example, dogs and cats can't interbreed and make sort of half dog kitten things. It doesn't work that way. But if we take any breed of dog, we could breed any two breeds together and yield viable offspring. If we have multiple breeds that we don't know what they are, we call it a mutt. But we also end up with things like golden doodles and puggles and all these wonderful creations that are simply the result of crossing different breeds of dogs. This clearly shows that every breed of dog all belongs to the same species. And in fact, you can actually breed any dog you want with a gray wolf and end up with, uh, with uh, you know, a wolf dog hybrid, again indicating that all of these, according to the BSC, are part of the same species. The same can't be said for the eastern and western meadowlark. They don't interbreed together, which is why they are considered to be distinct species. But the biological species concept has a few problems with it. First off, what happens if the species you're examining is asexual? 
Remember, the biological species concept wants us to consider the fact that these individuals need to interbreed to produce viable offspring. Do bacteria ever interbreed? No. So there's a great question as to whether asexual species, particularly prokaryotes like archaea and bacteria, do they even fall into species in the way that we typically think of a species when we talk about sexually reproducing eukaryotes? And that's sort of up for debate, whether you're a bacteriologist or whoever's considering that. Typically, when it comes to these, we use things like biochemical reactions, uh, physiologic and genetic assessments to determine whether this particular bacterium belongs to this species or that species and whether they represent truly different species or, uh, or, or strains of, uh, of a single species. And sometimes those, those lines are, are fuzzy uh, when you try to divide them up. Also, what if the species is extinct? So what if you're relying on the examination of fossils? Like, for example, we can't apply the biological species concept to any type of dinosaur because we can't take the fossils from this raptor and try to mate them with the fossils of this raptor to make a fossil baby. It doesn't work that way. So we're left with more traditional analyses, things like anatomy and physiology. And also we're aided by the fact that, you know, if a fossil is found in a rock layer 50 million years more recent than this fossil, chances are they weren't around to mate with each other at the same time. So we rely on things like that uh, outside of the biological species concept. But as you can see, the concept of a species is a little bit tricky. So how does speciation occur? It's fairly easy to understand that species change over time. But if you have a, a species, how do certain members evolve along one path while other members of the species evolve along another path leading to a speciation event? Well, let's go back to one of the things that Darwin observed. One of the things that Darwin observed is that when he looked at similar, closely related species, they were typically separated from each other by some type of barrier. Whether it was the rheas, some living in the highlands and some living in the lowlands, or whether it was the tortoises or the finches on the Galapagos Islands that were separated by water, there was some type of barrier in between those separate species. And Darwin rightly argued that most commonly, especially when it comes to species like animals, some type of geographic isolation is essential for a speciation event to occur. Now, barriers can come in many forms. It could be a mountain range. It could be the widening of a river. It could be the sudden appearance of land. It could be uh, birds that go on a long distance migration and then don't find their way back to their ancestral homeland. It could be lots of different things. But what has to happen for a speciation to event to occur in most cases, seems to be there needs to be a, a lengthy isolation event where a population of a given species is reproductively isolated from other members of the species. Now, the thing to realize about speciation events, when we talk about what could have happened to, to lead to a speciation event, a lot of people often say, well, that's really crazy. That's pretty rare. Like, what are the odds that that would happen? And that's true. Speciation events are rare, and they typically do happen by accident. And quite often, in many cases, freak accidents are likely the reason why some of these things happened. But what we have to understand is that even things that are extremely unlikely or rare, with enough opportunity, become likely. For example, the Powerball. Your odds of winning the Powerball are worse than 1 in 200 billion for any ticket that you play. Yet, week after week, people keep winning Powerball jackpots. It's a big deal when several weeks go by and someone doesn't win one, but then inevitably, somebody does. The odds are infinitesimal. They're less than getting struck by lightning, yet someone continues to win the Powerball on a recurring basis. Why? Because after enough tickets are sold, after hundreds of millions of Powerball tickets are sold, it now becomes quite likely that at least one person is going to win the Powerball. In fact, quite often, multiple people win the Powerball. The same thing can be said about speciation events. While the events leading to speciation are quite unlikely, if you give it millions of years to occur, it's a virtual lock that it's going to happen. So, for example, is it quite unlikely that a storm 
something in the line of a typhoon perhaps, could strike the western coast of South America and blow a few finches or even a single impregnated female finch so high up into the air, out to sea, that she comes to rest or they come to rest on the Galapagos Islands 500 miles off the coast of South America? Yeah, that's pretty crazy. And it's like a one in a million year storm. But guess what? It's pretty unlikely to happen today. But if I give you a million years worth of days, is it still that crazy that it could happen just once? No. Because given enough time or enough opportunity, even exceedingly rare events actually become quite likely. And that's kind of the way speciation events happen. A flock of birds go on a long distance migration and because they encounter a storm on the way back home, they end up 300 miles from where they're supposed to be. They begin to establish a new homeland from where they come and go from, from year after year and no longer interact with the original members of their population in their ancestral home. Perhaps a flood comes. It causes the river to, to get very wide for a while, but it never quite returns back to its normal to its normal depth, its normal width. And all of a sudden, species that used to freely go across that river are now trapped on either side, never to be able to interact again. And the population of deer, for example, could be split. Perhaps the earth cools gradually, causing the formation of ice caps at either pole. Correspondingly, ocean levels begin to drop, and the sea floor of a very shallow sea rises up and connects two continents. And now... Ground-dwelling species or seafloor-dwelling species, such as shrimp and crabs, they're now trapped on either side of dry land. Perhaps a few tortoises get washed out to sea following a tsunami or a typhoon, clinging to a log or even floating upside down on their shells, only to wash ashore weeks later on a barren island hundreds of miles off the coast of the continent from where they originated. Are these events exceedingly rare? Yes. But amazingly, we have evidence that suggests that events like these have happened not just once, but multiple times in the history of Earth. What you have to remember is that while speciation events are exceedingly rare, Earth has had billions of years, life has had billions of years for these speciation events to take place. So that one in a thousand year storm has happened hundreds of thousands of times. That one in a million year flood has happened hundreds of times in that time period that could lead to these wonderful and unique events which isolate distinct populations of a given species and causing them to go on their own evolutionary journey. So Darwin was likely right. Darwin described the fact that geographic barriers are likely essential for speciation to actually occur. Now we do know that not all forms of speciation require what we call an allopatric speciation event. So allopatric speciation occurs when species diverge from each other as a result of geographic isolation. Some speciation events are sympatric. They occur without that initial geographic isolation. Although, as we'll see later on in the video, these are largely going to occur in species such as plants. But when it comes to animals, for example, Allopatric speciation appears to be the rule. You need an initial geographic isolation before you can get speciation to occur. And the reason in animals, for example, is because they are sexually reproducing species and they form something called a gene pool. So remember that a gene pool is the sum of the alleles within a given population of a species. But when you end up with a geographic speciation event, whether it's ending up on an island, for example, off the coast of the continent from which the remainder of your species members exist, now all of a sudden that gene pool is separated. It's blocked from gene flow. Gene flow refers from the movement of alleles from one population, from one gene pool into another. But if you're Darwin's finches, if you're a finch species that ended up mistakenly on the Galapagos Islands, you are now separated from the remaining members of your species by 500 miles of ocean. There's no way gene flow could occur between your island population 
and the remaining members of your species back on the continent. And as a result, rapid evolution is going to begin to occur. Let's explore why that happens to be the case. Once the two populations have been split, we'll think about this finch species, and we'll use that as an example. Once a small population of finches is made to the Galapagos Islands, they are now going to begin their own evolutionary journey. And the reason why is they are now in a completely different habitat. Gene information, those random mutations that are slowly going to occur in any population, cannot flow from the island population of finches back to their cousins on the mainland continent. Moreover, the island species is going to be subjected, subjected to entirely different selection pressures than their mainland cousins. Welcome back to the concept of relative fitness. They may have arisen on the island best adapted for their continental home, but now life on the island is going to be different for them. There's going to be different food sources, the presence or absence of different predators. The size of their environment is going to be significantly smaller. It might be comprised of different soil, different food sources. And in fact, this is exactly what those finches must have found when they arrived on the Galapagos Islands. They arrived in an entirely different habitat with totally different selection pressures acting on them. And as a result, some of those alleles that were in the population, which may not have been beneficial, in fact, they could have been neutral or even harmful, may now become advantageous. The other thing that likely happened when those finches got there is there probably weren't many other species on the Galapagos anyways. And as a result, there were a ton of open ecological niches, sources of food, places to live, lifestyles that they could evolve into that were not available to them on the mainland. This leads to something that we commonly see with island species. It's called an adaptive radiation. And Darwin noticed this with both the Galapagos finches and the Galapagos tortoises. An adaptive radiation happens when one or two founder species arrives on an island, then rapidly diversifies into significantly different but closely related species. We go from a single species of finch to over 30 species of Galapagos finches in a very short period of time as these different populations begin to evolve into their niches. So how does this happen? Well, first and foremost, we have to recognize that the Galapagos Islands is an island archipelago. There are lots of different islands. So as, as birds would make the flight across miles of ocean, they would end up in their own little pods of reproductive isolation. Certain species of Galapagos finch only exist on certain islands and no other islands in the Galapagos. It's a treasure trove of diversification and speciation. But moreover, there were lots of ecological niches. And when we look at adaptive radiations, one of the things we see are species occupying niches that they don't typically occupy. So for example, if we look at the different types of finches on the Galapagos, some of them are large ground finches that go around eating large seeds. Some of them are small ground finches that go around eating small seeds. Some of them are large tree finches that live in trees. And some of them are small tree finches that live in trees. Some of them are insectivores. There's even a woodpecker finch that has an elongated bill that's sort of hardened itself to be able to peck into trees and gather bugs, just like woodpeckers do. There's even a vampire fish that feeds off the blood of other birds. In no other place in the world will you find finches or even birds of any type filling these ecological niches. But because there was no other competition except the other finch species, they were able to sort of adapt with these unique adaptations into filling these niches. And to give you an example, in case you think, for example, well, well that, that woodpecker finch must be the best adapted woodpecker to, to live on the Galapagos Islands. No, it's not. If you brought in a non-endemic species like a pileated woodpecker, it would rapidly outcompete the woodpecker finch. And the woodpecker finch would probably go extinct as the pileated woodpecker dominated its ecological niche because of how wonderfully adapted it is compared to that woodpecker finch. We see this time and time again on islands. But this is how speciation events would likely have occurred. This is a terrific example of what speciation might look like and why once you get into reproductive isolation, once you get into that geographic barrier, gene flow is blocked. We don't see this adaptive radiation of the ancestral species on the South American continent. Why? 
because the selection pressures for those individuals haven't really changed. They were sort of locked in place. They were locked in their single ecological niche, filling the roles that they've filled for hundreds of thousands of years and still continue to fill. It's only those members that made it to the island that had all those ecological open niches that were able to begin to diversify like the Galapagos finches did. The same thing could be said for the Galapagos tortoises. Over enough time, the Galapagos finches or any species that experience significant geographic isolation will have diversified enough, will have evolved enough, acquired enough change that other reproductive barriers may come into play. And these will be important for keeping two species separated once they've been reintroduced to each other. There are two broad classes of barriers that exist to keep species separate and distinct from each other. The first are referred to as prezygotic barriers. Prezygotic barriers prevent the initial fertilization of the egg. Essentially, they're going to prevent reproduction from even trying to occur. Copulation events aren't going to happen. These include things like temporal isolation, so timing. These species don't reproduce at the same time of year, therefore they're never in the breeding season at the same time, so they don't reproduce. There are things like habitat isolation. So for example, you might have an aquatic version of a species and a land-based version of the species. For example, like sea tortoises and land or sea turtles and land tortoises. They're never around each other to mate anyways, so they wouldn't do it. There's something called behavioral isolation. For example, this comes from birds. Birds often have to sing the right song or do the right dance or perform the right display in order to attract a female mate. Well, if one species doesn't recognize the other, you know, recognize the male of another species, then they're certainly not going to interbreed. They don't recognize each other. And the last one's called mechanical isolation. Literally, the parts just don't line up. Um, it's impossible for the copulatory event to actually occur in the first place. Also, over enough time, post-zygotic barriers could arise as well. Post-zygotic barriers allow fertilization to occur, but either the fertilization leads to a non-viable fetus, in other words, the baby's not born or born dead or just doesn't work, or you end up with sterile offspring. In other words, you end up with offspring that's alive, but it itself can't reproduce. A classic example of this is the mule. It's a cross between a horse and a donkey. Horses and donkeys are able to mate with each other to produce mules, but mules are sterile. So that's the end of it. That's a post-zygotic barrier. You can't mate one mule to another to make another mule. Post-zygotic barriers include matricidal fetuses, so babies that actually grow so big that they actually kill the mom. Uh, zygote, uh, uh, chromosomal incompatibility, so if there's an improper number of chromosomes. Uh, humans and chimpanzees are a great example. They have a different number of chromosomes than us. Even though they're our closest, closest relative, um, there's a chromosomal incompatibility there. Wouldn't allow for it to happen. And the last one's called hybrid infertility. So literally the, the, the baby is just stillborn. The offspring just isn't alive when it's born. It just doesn't work out. So those are examples of barriers. And these barriers act to uh, keep species separated once re reconnection can actually occur. Now, is it possible for speciation to occur without the initial geographic isolation? The answer is yes. And this is called sympatric speciation. Sympatric speciation is much more common in species like plants than it is in animals. One of the reasons for this is that sympatric speciation typically involves the, uh, it producing offspring with abnormal numbers of chromosomes. Plants seem to tolerate this really well, which has led some evolutionary biologists to, uh, to suggest that perhaps sympatric speciation is actually the rule as rather than the exception for plant species. So many different plants out there have the ability to do sympatric speciation events and in fact have done sympatric speciation events that it seems to be sort of a normal way of speciating in plants. It kind of makes sense though because plants don't have an, as easy of a time as, of dispersing as animals do. Animals on the other hand don't handle chromosomal abnormalities very well and thus sympatric speciation uh, contributes very little if at all to the evolution of animal species. So like I said, uh, sympatric speciation most often relies on some sort of chromosomal incompatibility. It's typically called polyploidy, an abnormal number of chromosomes. There are two kinds. There are autopolyploidy and allopolyploidy. Autopolyploidy is going to involve self-fertilization. Essentially what's going to happen is during the meiotic process, there is going to be some sort of non-disjunction event or some other error that's going to result in the production of diploid, or diploid gametes. 
So it's supposed to go from a 2N gamete to an N gamete, haploid, just like a sperm and egg should be. But if a plant is able to produce diploid 2N sperm and diploid 2N eggs and can self-fertilize, those diploid sperm and eggs could actually fertilize each other, producing a tetraploid zygote. Now, if that tetraploid zygote is viable, and that seed goes on to grow into a mature adult, even if normal meiotic processes happen, it's going to produce diploid gametes all along the line. Essentially, what's happened through this event is an automatic new species. Since the gametes produced by that tetraploid offspring wouldn't even be able to mate back in with any other member of its original species. Allopolyploidy is going to involve the, uh, the fusion of gametes from two different species with different numbers of chromosomes. It typically involves more than one round of mating. But again, the end result is simply a brand new species right out of the gate because this newly produced offspring would not have chromosome numbers that match either of the original parental species and would be forced to reproduce against essentially through self-fertilization with itself or if other progeny were produced through the same process or their offspring produced with the same process, they could go on to fertilize each other. But again, automatic new species simply because you don't have the same number of chromosomes and they can't interbreed with other members of the original parental species. Now, there have been some interesting case studies into the sympatric speciation of animals. One of them stems from a, a several species, several hundred species of cichlid fish in three lakes in Africa, Lake Victoria, Lake Malawi, and Lake Tanganyika. Now, what's really interesting is these three lakes each have several hundred species of cichlids. They are distinct true species, separate species of cichlid fish. But what's interesting is they it all seems to be giant adaptive radiations, which we typically only see when we have isolation events occurring. But as you know, with lakes, they're one continuous body of water. All these hundreds of species in each lake could trace their ancestry back to two or three founder species within each of the lakes, which is, a, which is very, very interesting. So how then? Could hundreds of species of cichlid fish evolve from just, a, from just a few initial species in single lakes? Well, it may uh, understanding of this may come down to understanding both the history of the lakes as well as the geology of the lakes. First and foremost, right now, these three lakes are all separated from each other. But one of the things that we know is that throughout history, these lakes have varied greatly in the amount of water contained within them. At some points being connected by small rivers, they were all connected at one point, and at other points being so dry that, in fact, one of them may have dried up entirely at some point in the history of that particular lake. What this tells us is that there has been opportunities for certain species to flow from one lake to another and then only to be cut off again when the water levels drop. But the other thing to understand about these lakes is they're not smooth bottom lakes. They have great valleys, shallow bays, rocky outcroppings. The depth varies greatly throughout the width and the length of each of these lakes. And what researchers have proposed have happened is these species have been allowed to occur. And essentially, sympatric speciation without polyploid because of these micro environments. One of the things that researchers have noticed is that these species live in very, very specific locations in each of the lakes. One species would live in this shallow bay. One species only lives around this rocky outcropping. One species is the only one that lives in this particular trench, while there's a completely separate species in the next trench over from it. What it appears is these fish species have sort of adapted by forcing their own geographic isolation by living in their own little areas. Because those species that live in the shallow water up of the rocky outcroppings never wander into the trenches. It's too deep for them. And those deep dwelling cichlids never come up to the top to hang out in those shallow bays. In other words, they've sort of cut themselves off by creating their own little microenvironments. Where we as humans see one united body of water, the cichlids don't see it that way. They see it as a mountain range and a valley and an island. And they live in their own respective microenvironments. Regardless of the outcome, the study of cichlid fish provides very, very cool insight into how the evolution of animals can happen. And technically, sympatric speciation can, if you want to call it that, happen with animal species without the need for polyploidy.
So what happens when two species who have diverged from each other through a speciation event come back into contact with each other? Well, there are three potential outcomes, and a lot of it comes down to how strong those barriers between the species are. The first type of reconnection is called reinforcement. Reinforcement occurs when the reproductive barriers between the two diverged species are so strong that gene flow is essentially blocked from occurring. Now, what could happen in these scenarios is either the two species are unable to reproduce to produce fertile or viable or to produce viable hybrids, or there are fi viable hybrids, but they're less fit than either species. I'll give you a few examples. Tigers and lions are actually able to interbreed to produce ligers. However, ligers, like mules, the cross between a donkey and a horse, are completely sterile. And because they can't go on to reproduce with either a lion or a tiger or another lager, it effectively is a dead-end reproduction. And the bottom line is that the gene flow between lions and tigers has now been effectively cut off. And these two species will continue to diverge. And it wouldn't be surprising at some point in the very distant future if lions and tigers became so different that even if they were in the presence of each other, they wouldn't be able to interbreed. That's the point to which humans and chimpanzees have already gotten after just 7 million years of being separated as species. While chimpanzees and humans are 99.9% .9 genetically identical, they are definitely each other's nearest relatives. It's physically impossible for a chimpanzee-human hybrid to be made. We're just so evolutionarily different that it can't happen. We actually have different chromosome numbers, uh, which helps to prevent that. The second type of reconnection is known as a fusion event. It's basically the opposite of reinforcement. Reinforcement refers to the fact that it reinforces the existence of the two species. Fusion is the opposite because what happens in a fusion event is that the reproductive barriers that have popped up during the divergence of the two species aren't strong enough to keep them separate. And as a result, the two species begin to interbreed and they'll produce hybrids that are as fit or more fit than either of the individual species themselves. And over time, the two species fuse back up together into a single united species. Now, to be clear, that, that species that emerges from the fusion of those two separate species doesn't necessarily have to look like, in fact, it probably won't look like, the original species that existed when the initial geographic isolation began. It probably won't look like that because each will be bringing newly evolved traits due to the selection pressures they've experienced during the isolation event. But nevertheless, the two individual species are no longer treated as several separate species, and they become one united species at that point. The third possible outcome is called stability. Stability occurs when the barriers are sufficiently weak where interbreeding can occur. But the hybrids that are produced are neither less reproductively fit nor more reproductively fit than either of the individual's original species. So as a result, you kind of end up with three species instead of two. You have the original purebred species as well as a hybrid species that exists, and all three continue to persist, hence stability. You have the two uh, original species plus the hybrid going around. A very interesting case study, and one of the things that's going to help answer our question from the first part about grizzly bears and polar bears, is what's going on now in North America. It had been widely believed that grizzly bears and polar bears diverged from a common ancestor somewhere between 500,000 and 750,000 years ago. And grizzly bears and polar bears had always been treated as good species. In other words, they are reproductively distinct from each other. One of the things that helped to reinforce that was a geographic barrier. Polar bears lived up on the Arctic ice shelf in the far northern part around the North Pole. Grizzly bears inhabited more southern climes. They lived, for instance, in the western part of the United States and the western part of Canada in the mountainous regions. It was too cold up north for the grizzly bears to wander too far into polar bear territory, and it was too warm for polar bears to wander onto the continental shelf and interact with grizzly bears. And as such, they remained reproductively isolated. In the past few decades, global climate change has caused a significant warming in the northern portion of the globe. And as a result, the ice shelves are retreating and polar bears are being forced more and more to come onto the continental shelf in order to survive. At the same time, grizzly bear ranges are wandering, are, are expanding farther and farther north. 
And now we're at the point where grizzly bear ranges and polar bear ranges are beginning to overlap. And as a result, we're starting to see interactions between grizzly bears and polar bears. What brought this to our attention was a not so infrequent sighting of what residents of this particular part of the world have been referring to as some type of grizzly bear polar bear hybrid. And at first this was scoffed off because no biologist really believed that grizzly bears and polar bears could or would interbreed given the opportunity. But as the, as the incidents and the sightings became more and more common, biologists went up there to investigate. And lo and behold, what they discovered was exactly that, a grizzly bear polar bear hybrid that has been described as a growler bear or a pizzly bear. I prefer growler bear, but they're also called pizzly bear. And when you look at these, here's a picture of them. First off, they're adorable. But secondly, you can clearly see that it is a hybrid between both a grizzly bear and a polar bear. So I'm guessing it's just some sort of horrifying eating machine with the instinct to eat humans of a polar bear and the ferociousness of a grizzly. I have no idea, but at least the babies are really, really cute. And one of the things that we found is not only are these growler bear hybrids viable, but they're also fertile. They're able to interbreed with other growler bears as well as polar bears and grizzly bears. So the question that we don't have an answer to yet, and we won't for a very long time, is are we looking at a fusion event or are we looking at stability? So are the polar bears going away? Yeah, looks like global climate change is having a pretty pronounced impact on polar bear populations. And it's very likely that polar bears may disappear or are they simply going to become growler bears over the next few centuries? We don't know. That's some, an active area of investigation. But it does show you what can happen when we have to think about how species interact when they reconnect. One of the other things that's happened is because they are able to interbreed, which we didn't think was possible, we've had to reanalyze how old we think the separation event between grizzly bears and polar bears was. And now people are as now now biologists are estimating that it's significantly shorter than perhaps even 500,000 years since those two species emer diverged from each other. Thank you so much for tuning in. Today we talked about speciation, uh, which is the result of macro evolution or a significant enough change in time. Uh, where one species, uh, one population of a species can rightly be called a new species. We learned that for the most part, this is going to be the result of an initial geographic separation, which separates the gene pools and allows each population of, of, a, of an existing species to kind of go off on its own evolutionary adventure, which might lead to the formation of new barriers and a, the, the classification as a distinct species. We also talked about the fact that this can happen uh, in a sympatric setting. In other words, we could get evolution through polyploidy, for example, in plants, uh, where we get instant new species through the result of uh, errors during the, during the meiotic process. We also talked about what happens when species that have diverged from each other come back into contact. Thank you so much for tuning in. I hope you learned a lot today, and I will talk to you real soon. Bye.